you. Of all the current cabinet members, nobody, apart from the Prime Minister herself, is perhaps as influential right now as Michael Gove. An ardent campaigner for Brexit, he chose not to resign over the Chequers plan or the withdrawal agreement, though he did go pretty quiet for a time. Well, he's with me now. Uh, Michael Gove, you're here really to sell Theresa May's plan. If you're so keen on it, why are you not Brexit Secretary? Because I enjoy being Environment Secretary and I enjoy having the opportunity to make sure that as a result of this deal, we will be able to be outside the common agricultural policy, outside the common fisheries policy, we'll be able to maintain high environmental protection, but on our terms, this deal, of course, is not perfect, but it does provide uh, those of us who campaigned to leave with an opportunity to take back control of our borders and have control of our immigration policy. It means that we end okay. the huge automatic sums that go to the EU every week, and it gives us the capacity in huge sectors of our economy to diverge if we think that's right. We'll come on to all of that, but why is it not perfect, first of all? Well, um, what, what, what worries you about it, particularly? Well, the area which I have the greatest concern about, but I think it's important to put it in context, is the backstop. I would have preferred it if we had a unilateral right of exit. It is uncomfortable for me that there are some rules that might apply in Northern Ireland that might not apply in other parts of the United Kingdom. However, but, but, the critical thing about the backstop is that however uncomfortable it is for the UK, it is more uncomfortable for the European Union because we will have tariff-free access to their markets well, without well, paying a penny. And more than that, and we will have control another, of our okay. borders if you were an Italian well, politician just, and you saw... Before we come to the Italians, no, no, no. let me just ask no, no, you a I little bit about critical. this. I think it's critical that people understand that oh. the backstop, while it does contain elements that for a unionist or for a Brexiteer aren't perfect, it also contains elements well, that for any European politician would did, allow okay. them to see Britain having a competitive advantage over their own country and their own economy. So to put it another way, we are locked into this, we are handcuffed into this backstop with no autonomous way out. No way out just but for ourselves and we have to trust that the Europeans are so uncomfortable that they choose to let us out in their good time. And that is what the legal advice which you have seen says. It's not a matter of trust. It is a matter of self-interest on the part of the Europeans. Do you think well, that we, Europeans... We said that, were, that their self-interest was going to give us a fantastic trade deal, well, and it didn't. We said that their self-interest was <coughs> well, easy think... for us to leave, and it didn't. And now we say their self-interest will mean yes. that they will let us out of the backstop, and maybe it won't. Well, consider this. If you were a European politician, would you be happy with another country having tariff-free access to your market, not paying a penny for it, capable of controlling its own migration policy, capable of diverging well, in agriculture and services, if and I capable if also... I, if I let me finish, them, Andrew. Okay, let me finish. And capable also in services of making its economy more competitive. This fundamentally works against the interests of the single market and against the interests of European nations. That is why European nations... Um, and in particular the Commission, and in particular uh, President Macron, will not want the backstop to subsist for any length of time. President Macron just last okay. Sunday made it clear that he didn't like the backstop because he would not have access to our territorial waters. But he was what going goes to for force France to goes for that. all those he was, countries. He, was going to, he had us over a barrel, he thought. No, he, would he eventually doesn't. Force, force he doesn't have that. us over a He's barrel. He's got us over a fish barrel. No, he, did, he, he doesn't have us. We've got him over a barrel of herring and a barrel of mackerel because he wants that access to our waters we can sit in the backstop and say, no, absolutely not. We and while we're in that backstop, we're in that backstop, we're taking we EU don't rules. Need, no, we don't, we're taking EU rules. No, that's yes, wrong, are. Andrew. We do not have to accept e new EU rules while we are in the backstop, okay. save in two discrete areas. So we like are able areas, to diverge no. as a result of being in the backstop. And it's because okay. it's so uncomfortable for let, the European let Union you, let me ask you that this. they want to ensure right. that we get a good trade deal at the end of let it. Let me ask you this. At any stage over the last few weeks, did you say in private that you thought this was a bad deal? I said lots of things in private, but I'm not in going to the private conversations that I had with the Prime Minister or anyone think else. this is quite a bad deal? No, I think, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it's not 100% of what I would want. Did you ever but think about resigning over the last few weeks? It's not 100% of what we wanted, but then we didn't get 100% of the vote on the 23rd of June in 2016 on that referendum. Did you not I have a long, dark night of the soul and consider resigning from Cabinet over this deal? I reflected long and hard about this deal, mm. but I've concluded, like lots of people, that while it's imperfect, it is the right thing to do. And I think it's because, okay. it's because Andrew, I understand 
and appreciate and feel uncomfortable with parts of this deal, that I also understand and appreciate how many of my colleagues feel. And one of the things that I hope that people will have the chance to do over the course of the next nine days is to recognise that we should not make the perfect the yeah. enemy of the good. We have got to recognise that if we don't vote for this deal, the alternatives are no deal or no Brexit. I want to come directly to that. First of all, do you think that the government has the votes to get this through at the moment? Um, I believe that we can win the argument and win the vote. I know it's challenging, but my view really? is... You can win this vote? Absolutely. My view is that uh, we've got to make those arguments and we've got to, I was about to say confront, we've got to look properly at okay. what those alternatives are. Now because you, it's perfectly well, I want, possible I want to, come to say... directly to those alternatives indeed, now. Because it's perfectly so, possible to so, say, I don't like yeah, this deal. But, this but the question is... Yes, exactly. The, the what question are the alternatives? Becomes, what happens then? Let's assume, just for the sake of argument, that it is voted down by a reasonably substantial majority and it's off the table. First question, can the Prime Minister then go back to Brussels, uh, negotiate some twists and turns and addendums and, so, and come back to the House of Commons, maybe after the markets have been falling, there's a general air of national crisis, and make MPs vote again? No, I, I, think, I think that that hypothesis is flawed. I think the, 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 key, so things, no. I okay. think the key things are, one, um, if we don't get this deal through, then there is a chance of no Brexit at all or how a second referendum. Okay, how does no Brexit happen? There is a chance that we could find ourselves with uh, uh, the votes in the House of Commons determined to impose upon us a second referendum. The people we heard but, from Delia Smith... But, no, Andrew, no, but, no, 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 there but, is a no, real no, risk. Let, let me intervene there on is this. A, no, no, really not, not yet. There is a real oh. risk that if we don't vote for this deal, that there may be a majority in the House of Commons for a second referendum. And there is also a risk that if we uh, don't vote for this deal, we may get a less good deal or no deal at all. And that's why I think all of those are less okay, attractive well, than this the, deal. Let's stick with the second referendum thing. The problem with that thesis is that whatever the Commons votes, a second referendum requires the government to engineer it, make it actually happen. Yes. And we have a government that is totally opposed to that. Yes. So the government could simply refuse to have that second referendum. But if it did, what you're saying is you have to vote for this because I am frightened that if the British people were given a chance to vote again, they would vote to stay inside the EU. No, I'm, I, I actually think if there were a second referendum that uh, people would probably vote to leave in even larger numbers than they did before but the very act of calling a second referendum I believe would damage faith and democracy and uh, and rip apart the social fabric of this country because it would confirm in the minds of many not just who voted leave but also okay. many who voted remain that okay, the establishment yeah. are prepared to give you a choice but if you make the wrong choice then you have to choose again. One of the things about okay, the referendum it's a, it's a is that bit, people it's a whose voices had never been heard before and certainly never been listened to had a chance to say, look, we want this country to follow a different course. If they were now told, sorry, you were too daft or you were too uh, prejudiced uh, last time round, think again, then I think that would, um, as Barry Gardner you're, you're, you're has argued as well, it would undermine faith in our democracy. But the thesis is still that giving people a chance to vote undermines faith in democracy, which in itself sounds a little bit odd. Let me move, however, to the other... No, it's, it's just... Why, well, why, you know, why, are we, what... uh, why are we um, asking people again on the basis that they got it wrong last time round? Well, and on I the think... basis that things have changed. They didn't understand everything that was going to pertain so between were, the Brexit vote... So they were too thick vote. to make the decision then, were well, they? you didn't understand what was going to happen after 2016, after that vote. None of us did. Nobody understood I what was going to happen. Uh, now we do. Yes, but people knew that they were voting to leave the European Union and we should honour that verdict. Okay. I think the idea that people were somehow, uh, you know, too dim to appreciate uh, what was uh, being offered at the time, I think that is profound. I know you're not, I'm saying, not saying, saying it that yourself. At all. I know I'm you're saying not saying it yourself. Life's moved on. Uh, exactly. But, some, some, okay. but I fear that many people would interpret the attitude of those who are arguing for a second referendum, so, and I know you're being objective, so, but I think they would interpret the attitude of those people as condescending. Let, let me say that there are various possibilities. Yes. So we've talked about the second referendum, and we'll talk a little bit about no deal in a moment. Mm. But there is another one you didn't mention, which is the idea of Britain uh, re redrafting or asking to redraft the political declaration yes. so that we stay inside EFTA, or yep. the European Economic Area. Um, more or less in perpetuity. That's an idea that's being discussed in Cabinet, 
out of Cabinet by other Tory MPs. Your name has been attached to this idea as well. What is your real view of that? My real view is that it is not as good as this deal. It is better to be outside the European Union, and being in the EEA or EFTA is better than EU membership, but this deal offers us uh, opportunities which um, uh, the so-called Norway option does not. If we had the Norway option, we would have less control over our borders, mm -hmm. we would be giving more money to the European Union, that, yeah. and we would have less control over our services. One but, of the things but, that but Barry Gardner sorry, said earlier... Sorry, again, if, if this particular deal yes. nevertheless can't get through the House of Commons, there is some evidence that the EFTA answer might be able to command support in the House of Commons. In those circumstances, would you support it? I think the right thing to do is to argue for this deal because it's better. I think this deal is better, and as Barry Gardner pointed out, earlier. It allows us to diverge in a number of areas. One of the reasons some people on the Labour benches don't like it is because they recognise that there is flexibility for Britain in a huge swathe of its economy as a result of this deal and, and they don't want to see that flexibility yeah, yeah. and that's why I think it is right in the course of the next nine days to look at all the options and to spell out why this deal, because it gives us control of migration and money, uh, fish and agriculture, well, and the control of 80% okay. of our economy is the right deal. Let's logically come to the last of the options we haven't talked about, which is no deal. Yes. Described as a national calamity, a disaster, chaos, and in many other ways. Do you also regard that as a, a hideous thing to be for the country to be facing? I, I think that there are problems, definite problems with no deal. I think that uh, there have been some blood-curdling warnings that have been issued that are, are not quite right. But some but by people running companies, people <coughs> who actually know what they're well, doing, well, quite, running their own companies. Well, I think, I think the, the important thing is to get this in proportion. As I say, there are some blood-curdling warnings which are not justified, uh, but it is the case that if we were to leave without a deal, mm. I think we would undoubtedly go through a period of turbulence. I do not want that to happen. Okay. I think that there would be uh, uh, trouble for the economy as a result of that. One of the reasons I voted to leave is because we have become so entangled in so many ways with the EU. 45 years. Exactly. Yeah. And getting, getting out of that okay. will take a little bit of time and care and Very wrenching different. ourselves out of it without a deal while... Um, okay, uh, it's, it's not as bad as it's, some it's have very argued. Difficult to do, but it, is, it is economically clearly going to cause hurt, yes. Is this the first government in our entire democratic history which has, as a matter of public um, policy and intention, decided to make this country poorer? No, absolutely not. I think one of the... Well, that's, that is going to be the, the, the effect of this deal. Your no. own government's figures no. show... I'm going to show you a graphic now. There's a graphic produced by departments across Whitehall, yes. not just by remainery treasury people or whatever, and the white paper model re uh, reduces our growth by 4%, as no deal is even worse. No deal is more than 9%. Well, that is a substantial hit on ordinary families and people watching this programme. Well, two things I would say. Firstly, that is, um, even on the, the uh, figures in that paper, it's not an instant hit that's over a period of time. It, but yeah. it is a projection, and it is a projection, and those, I've talked to them, who wrote that paper made it clear that uh, uh, that is a projection if everything else stays the same. It is... Uh, simply one scenario well, and one model. And of course, well, the government unlikely. in every scenario and in every model can take steps in order to improve economic growth. So those projections are, are one way of informing the debate, but they're not definitive. They are not a prediction. They are not an oracle. They are simply no. a set of data uh, which you can look at. They're a scary warning. Well, they, they, they mean, according to the NISR, uh, £1,100 per family, per person, not per well, family, per person watching this programme. And that's, again, it's a highly respected body. No, they say no, that's no, no, what it would cost. Well, during the last referendum campaign, uh, or during the referendum campaign, I should say, God forbid there should be another one, um, uh, I was criticised for calling out some of these economic forecasts. People said that I was pouring cold water mm -hmm. on expertise. Okay. But actually, we saw after the vote uh, to leave that many of those predictions were proven wrong. Now, I think here, the important thing to do is to look at the economic analysis, subject it to right. proper forensic criticism, recognise that there is some validity within it, but Philip, it is not uh, definitive and not an oracle. But the Philip one thing Hammond, I do want to say... Chancellor, the one thing I do want to say... Remaining it, in Andrew, the EU is that, would be a better outcome from the economy than every other option. Well, I... I every this, other option. This is a rare occasion where there is a scintilla of difference between myself and Philip, in that I think that we can do better outside the European Union, but it is the case that if we leave without a deal, while uh, we would adjust over time, 
because yeah, this is it. a great country. Nevertheless, uh, for, for a period, there would be economic uh, turbulence, if undoubtedly. Ther if Theresa May loses this vote, does she have to go as Prime Minister? Absolutely not. Why not? Because she's uh, lost her policy, she's lost the purpose of her government. There's no, no way forward for her, no, is there? Uh, no, I think... Does she call an election is the alternative? No, Do you think that's possible? No, I think that uh, uh, the most important thing is, uh, you know yourself, Andrew, from uh, being around the country, that there are lots of different views about this deal. Mm. Few people think it's perfect. But one of the things I've seen with my own eyes over the course of the last couple of weeks is a strong movement behind the Prime Minister. Sympathy for her position, admiration for the deal that she has um, uh, secured after long negotiation, and a, a desire to see her bring this deal home and secure right. Brexit. So I'm okay. supporting the Prime Minister okay, like I believe you. a majority of people in this country. Michael Gove, not quiet this morning. Thanks very much. Almost out